The first tool that can be used to create cool visualizations based just on a DEM or elevation data is called hill shading, or sometimes also called shaded relief mapping. These things are used to create a realistic view of the terrain. It shows what a surface would look like when illuminated by a hypothetical light source coming from a certain direction. So you get these different shadows based on the direction of sunlight. So you end up with a realistic three-dimensional view of elevation by inserting areas of uh, lit up terrain and shadowy terrain into your model. So it's really a visualization tool rather than an analysis tool. You can take a map of elevation and really make it pop and really put it into three dimensions by using this technique. With a hill shade, you basically have a hypothetical position of the sun along with a DEM. The hypothetical position of the sun, which is the, the light source in the imaginary sky up above your DEM, is based on two parameters, which is the azimuth, or the direction of the light source, and the zenith. So like aspect, azimuth is measured in degrees starting from zero, which is the north, and increasing in that clockwise direction so that 90 places the light source to the east, 180 places it to the south, and so on. Then altitude, or zenith, is the angle of that light source above the horizon. The minimum altitude of zero degrees puts the light source at the horizon, while the maximum altitude of 90 degrees places the light source directly overhead, and that would basically make it so that each pixel has the same amount of light on it. After the light source's location has been specified, a hillshade algorithm uses the slope and aspect of that DEM to determine how brightly each cell in the input elevation raster would be illuminated according to a light coming from this direction and this altitude. The output gives you brightness values in the resulting hill, hillshade raster that range from zero, or really dark and shadowy, basically blocked from that sunlight direction, to 255, which is the brightest possible value. So here are a couple examples of hillshades. The bottom right, that's kind of a final completed hillshade that's also classified in terms of the elevation of that location. In the top right right here, we actually have a couple examples of hillshades um, that are illuminated from different directions. So what we usually see is an azimuth of 315. It's unrealistic in the real world, but we're used to it and it's pleasing to the eye. This is the example on the top left right here. 315 means that location of the light source would be somewhere to the northwest, like that light bulb shown here. You can see with all these different ridges and hills that you can now pretty easily visualize that the backside has uh, shadowy areas and the front side has more lit up areas. That's just what you get as the output of this hillshade algorithm. An example of another direction for that light source is shown on the top right right here. Um, this actually kind of makes it really confusing to our eye because we're not used to this. Areas that are valleys look like hills. Areas that are hills look like valleys. Once you create this hillshade model that's just giving you a brightness value for each of these locations, then usually you layer it with something like an elevation layer to give it this 3D character, like you see on the bottom right, right here. Then another visualization using this elevation data are contours. Contours are able to portray detailed terrain information while still taking a backseat role cartographically. So instead of having like a hillshade where all you really see is that output hillshade raster, you can actually portray elevation pretty effectively with contours while also putting other information on a map. So this uh, phenomenon is shown in the figure at right. Here we have a hill shade just kind of showing a valley and steep sides to the valley. It would get really confusing if you tried to layer that with roads and buildings and power lines and things like that. But if you convert it to contours, like we see at the far bottom right right here, you can put these thematic layers on top of the elevation layer and you still can basically see what the elevation changes are in this area. Contours also allow reading of more complex info, like uh, slope, hill shade, and aspect. You can, you can calculate all these things pretty easily from contours by looking at the change in slope over a certain distance, which you can measure on a map. So there are a few properties of contour maps. There's fixed values for the interval between contours, which is something like either 20 meters or 100 meters. In principle, they never cross, but they can get really close to each other. That would indicate a steep slope. Uh, if you're going to create a contour map from a DEM, you'd connect lines through known values based on those contour values that you have. So you'd put like the 830 meter contour between the 825 and the 838. 
probably somewhere close to that 825 meter contour. So then if you're using 10 meter contours, uh, the next contour down would be 820. That 820 contour would go somewhere between that 799 and the 825. So that would start out just above where the 830 is. It would weave between the um, 799 and 825 known values. So here's an example of just a hand-drawn contour map. You have some known values for elevation. These could come from just surveyed spots like a map like this, or they could come from the cell values within a DEM. In this example, we have uh, contour intervals of 400 feet between those different isolines. If we draw the first isoline at 4,000, the next one would be 3,600, then 3,200, etc. Once you're done with this map, you can clearly see with these closed circles in the middle, that's the top of a hill and the elevation gets lower around the hill. So even though we're focused today on terrain analysis and surface analysis, as well as visualization of elevation, you can actually use contours for all sorts of different data. Using contours for any number of things that exist as continuous phenomenon in the real world allows a really good representation of how those things vary over space. So if you only have like point samples for something, it might be pretty hard to get an idea of how th those values vary over space. But by creating these maps with contours, you can see where the high points are, low points are, and how values vary. So we have the general term of isoline for these lines of equal value, like contours, but really for anything else. Um, and depending on what data you're actually portraying, an isoline could be called something else specifically. So for instance, um, isotherms are lines of constant average temperature. Isobars are lines of constant equal pressure. We used contour lines before to show the change in crime in San Diego in an earlier lab. You can also use isolines for showing uh, changes in density of people. So that example, like we did with that San Diego crime lab, is shown in the bottom right, where number of pedestrians uh, the density of those number of pedestrians is shown via contours. The last visualization method I'm going to talk about is what's called viewshed analysis. A viewshed identifies cells in an input raster that can be seen from one or more observation points that you put into the analysis. So this can be used to determine areas that would be visible from something like a proposed fire lookout station. Um, you'd be able to confirm line of sight connectivity between cell phone repeater towers or you might want to make sure that a hillside community wouldn't be able to see a proposed landfill site. So you can do all these things by inputting these uh, areas as input features and seeing what's visible from those features. To conduct a viewshed analysis requires two layers. You need these input features that make up one or more viewing points, and then you need that DEM layer. This is an example of something where you can't only use a DEM, you also have to use points of interest to see what's visible from those points. And unlike earlier operations that we talked about today, this viewshed analysis is a global operation. That means for each cell that you're computing a value for, every other cell is visited in this analysis. So for each of these observation points or cells of interest that you're calculating the viewshed for, uh, a line integrating elevation is created to each and every other cell in the entire data set. If land or an object that's in the data set rises above the line of sight that's created, then that target cell is not visible. So it's marked zero in the output. So in the figure to the bottom right, you can see the line of sight calculated from the observer point out to a pretty distant cell that looks like it's up in a highland area nearby. All those areas in green along this line of sight are visible from that point. All other locations along that line of sight are not visible. They're basically blocked by that steep slope area that is seen by the observer that's shown in green. A line of sight like this is created to all other cells in the data set, and you can calculate basically all the areas of green and all the areas of red for each of these observer points. So when this is done, you get an output like a scene in the top right up on this slide. From that observer point, Everywhere that's in that light green overlying output data set is shown as visible from that point. Everything else where you just see like the, the hillshade elevation raster underneath, that's not visible from that observer point. Sometimes the analysis might need to be refined to reflect real world conditions. You can change the height of the observer or of objects that are um, being viewed. So if you have like a building that you're looking from the top of, you might increase the, the 
beginning height of that observer by 30 or 40 feet. Uh, if it's an observation tower that you're trying to see how far you can see from a potential observation tower, you might increase that to 100 feet. You can also include calculations that integrate the curvature of the Earth. So if you're looking at a distance over five kilometers away, eventually the Earth starts to um, curve away from where you are, and it gets harder to see things on the horizon. Then over about 20 kilometers, it can get difficult to see things based on just visibility changes due to atmosphere. So you can include the impact of the atmosphere as well. Finally, you can improve the analysis a little more by including multiple observation points, as well as uh, linear or polygon features. So you want to see if like a power plant can be seen along a stretch of highway instead of just like one single location on that highway. All right, so that's it for this discussion of different surface tools and terrain tools. Um, different ways to take a DEM and get all sorts of different information about the world just from that initial information that we have on elevation. There are a whole bunch of tools I talked about. I wouldn't focus too specifically on knowing like the details or algorithms involved in these different tools, but I would try to think a little bit about in like reviewing this lecture and, and locking in the information from this lecture, um, think about when you would use each of these tools and what each of these helps you solve. So like if you're trying to do some sort of habitat analysis, you might want to know what the aspect is because different species uh, do better in either north facing or south facing slopes. If you want to know about a location that's visible from uh, behind a hill slope, if you're going to like build a new house, then you might want to use this view shed analysis here. I just have a good idea about the different types of analysis that exist and what each of these can do, what they're all able to accomplish.